It's time for Dialogue Conspiracy with political research specialist Mae Brussel, who for three years has shared with us her decades' research into political assassinations and abuses of power in this country. Her program relates the news of the week to emerging evidence about the conspiracy which allegedly maintains by force its control over the legislative and judicial processes in America. And now, here's May. Good afternoon. This is May Bressel in Carmel, California. Dialogue Conspiracy is January the 20th, 1975, and this is number 180 in the series of programs from Carmel. I want to talk about the conference in Boston again. I talked about last week the conference on conspiracies that's going to be taking place in January, January 31st and February 1st and 2nd. You'll be at Boston University. If you want information, write Assassination Information Bureau, 63 Inman Street, Cambridge, Massachusetts, 02139. You may want a list of the people who are going to be there for reference of <coughs> uh, current investigative reporters. Um, there's a long list of well-known researchers who will be at the conference. Mark Lane will be there. Penn Jones, Jr., Jeff Girth, Peter Dale Scott, Sherman Skolnick, Don Freed, Ted Chirac. I talked to Ted Chirac this week. <clears throat> for those of you who have listened to Dialogue Conspiracy for a long time, you have heard him on this show. He was in the Ambassador Hotel when Robert Kennedy was killed, and he produced a movie called The Second Gun. And the movie opened up last year in New York and Boston, and then went, the copies were bought up. And there's been a year of not being able to show the movie. The movie is available now, and Ted is going to have it in Chicago and in Washington in lieu of the new evidence, of the continuing evidence in the Sirhan case. Bob Cutler will be there talking about the Chappaquiddick uh, accident, Ted Kennedy's, uh, the uh, <laughs> Chappaquiddick affair. I can't say he drove into the water. I don't think he drove the car. We'll say the death of Mary Jo Kopechny. Bob Cutler bo wrote the book, uh, The Jury, you, the jury, regarding Chappaquiddick. And Richard Popkine will be there, who wrote the second Oswald. Wayne Chastine, who just finished a book, Who Really Killed Dr. King and the Kennedys. And possibly Bill Turner talking about the Wallace shooting. And hopefully I'll be back there, too, in Boston, attending that conference. It's a very complete conference for three days. I don't know how so much can be covered in those days, but if you live in the area or somewhere in the east and you want to get back there, it will be at Boston University the last weekend in January, the first two days in February. I currently am getting ready to teach at Monterey Peninsula College again, of course, Problems in Research, the John Kennedy and the Robert Kennedy assassination, along with Ray Fabrizio, will be teaching the course. It will be Humanities 195, and people in the local area are signing up now. You can take it for two units credit or you can audit the class without credit. Um, the Playgirl, I think I announced on Dialogue Conspiracy that I'm doing a series of articles for Playgirl under the title Dialogue Conspiracy. I just completed the second article. The first one will be on the stand in March, dated April. I, the first three are titled, Is It Necessary or Why Is It Necessary to Investigate John Kennedy's Death? The second one is your life safe when you become a researcher, or in effect, how dangerous is it to do research? And the third article I'll do next month is why hasn't the Kennedy family done anything about the assassinations? The first three articles that I did for hopefully a continuous series are based upon the questions that are asked most often when I speak at the colleges or publicly or in the mail, the letters I get are on radio talk shows or on television. I'm always asked these three questions in about that order, so I thought I would answer them in the Playgirl magazine on the stand in March. The first one will be out on the John Kennedy assassination. The third one that I'm going to do, the next one on the Kennedy family, has to do, uh, pertains to the news that's coming out today, January the 20th, about the ex-FBI men telling about secret files in Washington, D.C., because it's always been my feeling that the Kennedys did nothing because of their extramarital sex life, that they were blackmailed. Uh, when John Kennedy was killed, Robert Kennedy had been accompanying Marilyn Monroe, and I felt that uh, 
Frank Capel of Army Intelligence had all the data to write that book on the death of Marilyn Monroe before anybody else, and name Robert Kennedy as being responsible for her death, which would explain why, as the Attorney General, he didn't investigate his brother's death. Even though it was his brother, he was still the Attorney General. And Robert Kennedy had a going feud with J. Edgar Hoover. But somebody had the goods on Robert Kennedy, and I, so this kept him from investigating the death of his brother because uh, he had political aspirations of his own, and that would have blown it if the other news had leaked about his relationships. I don't know about other women, but Marilyn Monroe. And the same thing with Ted Kennedy. Uh, the FBI has been keeping files on congressmen for a long time, on the women they see, on their drinking habits, and their social habits in a way that they can be blackmailed. I think it's interesting that Cartha Deloach and Lewis Nichols are coming out at this time and admitting that the, the FBI has records of congressmen and their girlfriends. And I also think, so think it's interesting that the list of congressmen that came out today, the very first list, every single one of them is a Democrat and only one Republican, Lowell Weicker, which shows that the FBI was not used even for blackmail across the board objectively, but centered upon one particular party to keep the Democratic Party completely split. And I know the way that it controlled the votes when it came to Congress. Uh, Bobby Baker was alleged to have been responsible for call houses in Washington. I heard about those years ago. I called them the purple houses. They were supposed to be with lavender decorations and decorated with lavender color everywhere. And that, that it was alleged that Lyndon Johnson manipulated various congressmen one way or another into this call house or call houses, and then Bobby Baker would go down the Congress and hand, hand out slips of paper and tell the Democratic congressmen or Republicans, whatever, how to vote based upon blackmail. This I heard about years ago. There's no way to check this out, really, uh, but I think that the files, the consistency of the blackmail of the FBI keeping files on these men in Washington would line up to some of the information I had a long time ago. Another thing I know is that when these prestigious commissions are set up, very often the committees are set up with people that the FBI or the president have something on, and then they can pull it out later and affect the decisions or the questions of the committee. So along with the Democratic names that were in the paper today was Lowell Weicker, and I remember the Senate Select Committee investigating the Watergate. And later, Mr. Montoya was linked to mafia funds or campaign funding that was not legal, and I think somebody in his campaign had to pay a penalty. Senator Gurney has been indicted in a case in Florida, and they had the goods on him. And Lowell Weicker, uh, there was something in his past, obviously, if they kept these records, because he was on the right track, and he'd get just to the point of asking the right questions best, better than anybody else, and he'd stop short. Also, it was interesting how McGovern was manipulated into the position of being candidate for president, because at the time of the hearings, I believe it was uh, Ehrlichman or Haldeman was talking about McGovern, and they referred to an illegitimate child in Indiana, and they began to throw that smear around, and all of a sudden the papers in Indiana were scooped up and the birth records were grabbed. And if this were planted evidence, um, I think that Senator McGovern would have been able to illustrate that it was planted. So there must have been a little bit of truth in that, and that would explain how quiet Mr. McGovern was at the time the Watergate hearings were going and still is. In comparison to what was done to the Democratic Party through 1970 to 74, to what the Democrats had to say about it, you can see the method by which this blackmail works and has to work to silence their voices. I also remember the Watergate hearings where the Attorney General, former Attorney General, and Mr. Liddy were talking about call girls in Miami and boats and having the Democratic um, representatives on these boats to blackmail. Now, the thing is, they get them down at conventions and other places or hotels in Miami and get them in compromising positions, but they don't use that the next week or the next year. They wait till they have key positions or moving up in position and then pull the information out. And this is why you get so many time bombs, particularly against Democrats, and they're coming from the use of the White House using the FBI and the field officers 
to gather information and follow these particular people so they can be used uh, for blackmail. Now, all of this fits in with uh, what I've said for a long time, for many years, based upon my research, that the electoral process running Congress and running the elections is based upon two things since 1960, bullets and blackmail. And those two uh, methods of controlling the candidates or for office, for president, or for select committees uh, will be illustrated as the years go on that blackmail and bullets were the way the candidates were selected or important personages were carried out of office based upon this gathering that was done years earlier to keep them silent at a later date. Also, you remember at the Watergate hearings, Tony Lasowitz talking about having an apartment in New York and all the girls that had been at Chaffaquiddick with Ted Kennedy and friends of Mary Jo Kopechny were invited by male escorts and didn't know the escorts were paid by the intelligence agencies or the White House and they were in compromising positions and photographed. And then assured later, if they have responsible jobs or so forth, that uh, the blackmail would keep their silence as to exactly what happened at Jaffa Quiddick. Senator Kennedy made a funny quotation in the newspaper today regarding the FBI files on uh, congressmen. This was his quotation. If the facts contained in the Post article are true, they indicate that the constitutional rights of members of the legislative have been infringed upon by the executive branch. For a family that's been blackmailed continuously, these two brothers, and also John Kennedy, and followed continuously, uh, it's amazing that he didn't have something more harsh to state, but I suppose he isn't in a position to really come out and say, I told you so, and he has to cover up with one of these bland quotations. Uh, there's something in our local paper, Monterey Herald, Wednesday, January the 15th, which is important for the nation in terms of following California's uh, decisions on a new criminal justice study that's just going into effect to be studied. And I think of a book, I co the copy of it is it's called Anti-California, Report from Our First Parafascist State by Kenneth Lamote. And if any of you haven't read it, it's a very interesting book. And I'm going to read you a couple of sentences about California because you people back in Boston or Ohio or wherever you are, take a look at California, what's happening here, because a blueprint from the Justice Department has been made up of standards for safety of crime in the streets. It's called Safe for California, and by admission of the people that put this together, it's a test case for the other 59 states. So you better take heed. You know, the book... On California, the report from the first para fascist state on page four, it says the cliches about California have become cliches because they are true. California is the distant warning system for the rest of the United States. California is our window in the future. California is the center of the whirlpool where all the currents come to a focus. Reports from California are the minutes of the next meeting. What is going on here is not the superurban nightmare of New York and Chicago or the slow rot of the South or the death of the political spirit in Washington, D.C. What is going on here instead is something that is even more dismaying, the disintegration of a state that should have been the brightest and the best, the corruption of the promised land itself. Here in California... We are governed by charismatic buffoons, and it goes into the men of power, tremendous power, and the modern catalog of death, the weapons that take place that are manufactured in this state. But the important thing, the minutes of the meetings, what's going on here, is what you're going to get next in the other 49 states. So I want to tell you a little bit about our first parafascist state, and I want you to write, you can write to... Uh, the criminal justice system, criminal justice system, 700 Cass Street, Suite 8 in Monterey, California, 93940. Next week I'll bring the Sacramento address and get a roster of the membership and the list of meetings that are going to take place. Safer California is a project that has been put together with goals and standards. There's many standards of uh, criminal justice in order to make California safe 
uh, to avoid crime. The Criminal Justice Planning Commission has set this up, and Monterey County District Attorney William Curtis is the chairman of the local Criminal Justice Planning Board. And there will be local meetings in February and March, and then state meetings. And the plan is to break down all the standards projects that are suggested and then bring them to Sacramento, but local communities will be meeting to hear what the new standards are going to be. Now, one of the standards is plans for mass arrests. I'm warning you in advance that they're very efficient. This is a new standard set up to meet riots later, food riots and job unemployment, I'm sure. Another standard is to plug into every home and this was brought up in Washington last year, in every radio, boat or car, and TV, a two-way radio system. I think it would cost everybody $5 to have themselves bugged in. A two-way radio system that was supposed to come out after the elections of 72 and the Watergate uh, stopped it in Washington, D.C. This safer, California safer, will open the door for dumb, dumb bullets. It's against international guidelines, and you can send for information on, this is a project that was set up at the Governor's Conference this last December, and there's a goal to accomplish before they meet next December to go down some of the standards. There's a list of several hundred standards, and it reads like a 1984. Can these things be stopped on time? I believe that they can be if enough people get interested and attend the meetings and get the book, the big book, from the Criminal Justice Department and begin studying it. And maybe each week I'll run down a few of the standards. But it's important to go to this office if you live in Monterey or Carmel, 700 Cass Street, Suite A, otherwise write to them. And it's at Monterey, it's not Carmel, it's Monterey, 93940. And begin to study California SAFER because SAFER, California, according to the book, is a set of standards to go all over the United States, and therefore it is important to send for it here in California because the book states that money, the funding, comes from Washington, D.C., and it's a test case for the other states on many, many laws that affect the prisoners, affect people, uh, innocent people outside on the street, the people arrested, it affects bail and assembly, the right to assembly, the right to privacy in your own home affects every aspect of your life. In order to make California safe, you're going to exchange almost all of your privacy and your rights. So you better get knowledgeable now with the Watergate exposures coming. People are less likely to turn over their freedom while the oppressors are being investigated. So get on it now and write to that office on Cass Street and begin to get some literature. General, Former Attorney General William Saxby as he stepped down and retired last week, had a suggestion which I've been making for a long time on Dialogue Conspiracy. He suggested last Wednesday in an interview that the government ought to launch a full-scale inquiry into not only the effectiveness of the CIA but all the other branches of intelligence. He said the military and the FBI should be joined along with the CIA. And I applaud that because I know that the Defense Intelligence Agency was directly responsible for the assassination of Robert Kennedy, John Kennedy, and Martin Luther King under the approval of the CIA working along with them. But the Defense Intelligence Agency budget is much, much larger than the CIA. And now that the CIA is being exposed, the next agency will be the uh, intelligence agency of the defense. And then he talked about military intelligence. You get a man like Gerald Ford from Navy intelligence or Richard Nixon from Navy intelligence, and these are not Republicans. We have been having a succession of military men in power since John Kennedy was assassinated with a little interim of Lyndon Johnson taking over while the old guard retrenched with the assurance he would step down. And since then, the military has been controlled in Washington. So it's time to investigate the military and the Defense Intelligence Agency, in addition to the FBI and CIA. This last week, since we met on Dialogue Conspiracy, the state Supreme Court has been asked officially to reopen the investigation of the assassination of Senator Robert Kennedy. Sirhan's lawyer, Godfrey Isaac, has petitioned that Sirhan was wrongly convicted, 
convicted by false ballistic testimony given police criminals Dwayne Wolfer. There's new evidence to show that second gun existed in the Ambassador Hotel. This is an important um, move. It has now been formally filed in the courts by Godfrey Isaac. Sirhan won him as his private attorney for a long time and was always stuck with the CIA attorneys. Finally, after five years, he has the attorney he wanted in the first place. But along with that uh, article on the Sirhan case being filed now, I have one here about the death penalty in California. And Evel Younger, the attorney for Attorney General in California, who supported the death penalty and pushed it through last year and was very anxious to get it, had an interview this week and said the very fact of the matter is we can't yet prove the effectiveness of the death penalty as a deterrent. But I'm satisfied that if it was used, it would be effective. But the important thing at the time the death penalty was put on the books again in California was pushed by Evel Younger, who is a district attorney prosecuting the Robert Kennedy assassination, Sirhan Sirhan was placed on death row along with Charles Manson. And as I've said many times on Dialogue Conspiracy, these alleged assassins are put up on death row. Hopefully, the re- I think the death penalty was reinstated to silence. Men that were innocent, so the guilty could remain on the street. And the cover story of the di- district attorney in L.A., who's now the Attorney General of California, would hold. The man who prosecuted that case could certainly know that Sirhan did not kill Robert Kennedy. He would have known it three weeks after the murder of Robert Kennedy if he had done his homework. And by killing Sirhan, the case would have been closed and never opened up. And this is one of the big deterrents to the death penalty that I never see printed anywhere and that I object to. I know that... that, uh, the personal feelings about the lives of the men, the suffering is always mentioned, whether they suffer, whether they don't suffer, or whether it deters people or doesn't deter people. And I have yet to see one national article in a magazine or a column mention the fact that the death penalty is being pushed by those very people involved in criminal conspiracies who want their patsies wiped out because it's Charles Watson who killed all the people at Sharon Tate's house and Mr. and Mrs. LaBianca wasn't uh, Charles Manson at all. He didn't murder any of those seven people. And Sirhan didn't kill Robert Kennedy. But if the death penalty had gone through at the time, they would be dead. And officially, the case would be closed. But this way, hopefully, maybe Sirhan will get out someday. And the evidence will come out that he didn't kill Robert Kennedy. But it's a tragedy that the people who prosecuted this case, so feebly, with all the evidence available otherwise, certainly if it's available to me sitting here in Carmel, California, without one cent of investigative resources and no footwork and no ballistic work, but knowing just by the witness testimony the way that thing came down that Sirhan couldn't have done it, but that he was used and hypnotized and believed he did it. And here our district attorney in Los Angeles becomes the attorney general of California and then wants the death penalty of his patsy. Well, Sirhan's alive in spite of the fact of the contract to kill him by the White House plumbers and Richard Nixon. He's still alive. That case is blowing open, too, and Godfrey Isaac is representing Sirhan, and hopefully he'll get a day in court to tell his story again. Another man's name came in the news this week uh, connected to the Warren uh, Commission, the Warren Report, that we'll talk about William Coleman. Last week on Dialogue Conspiracy, I talked about David Bellin, Jr., who's the head investigator for the Rockefeller Committee to investigate domestic CIA activities and explained how David Bellin was a CIA lawyer acting illegally in the United States for the CIA to cover criminal conspiracy in the Kennedy assassination, now appointed to investigate illegal domestic activity of which he was a part. Now, this week, William Coleman is named Secretary of Transportation, and a lot of people may think that Gerald Ford is turning very liberal. He has a black man, second black man ever to be on the United States Cabinet, William T. Coleman, Jr., as Secretary of Transportation. Well, Mr. Coleman's name comes up at a time where there's an expose of the CIA this week that I'll read to you of trying to infilter money overseas to control world transportation, which is also illegal and spying against our allies. 
and at a time where the CIA is being accused of controlling world transportation as well as domestic, a CIA lawyer by the name of William Coleman becomes Secretary of Transportation, which is consistent there with the CIA activity at home and abroad. Coleman is an attorney from Philadelphia. He'll succeed Claude Bringer. And as I say, he gives Mr. Ford the image of being a liberal. He is a Republican. Now, Mr. Coleman is one of those persons who urged Richard Nixon to resign rather than put the country through a lengthy and divisive impeachment process. He wanted uh, uh, Richard Nixon to step down and make way for Gerald Ford. That's his fellow member from the Warren Commission, Gerald Ford, and Mr. Coleman, and it was Mr. Coleman who suggested that Richard Nixon step down. If the impeachment process went on, we'd learn more about Richard Nixon and the Dallas team that worked in the Bay of Pigs together and then killed John Kennedy. But he wanted the country not to go through this impeachment process. Also, it's interesting that Mr. Coleman is one of the men who argued that the president should be allowed to destroy the tapes. Former President Richard Nixon should be permitted to destroy the tapes and documents before he left office. Now, this is old cover-up Coleman from way back 10 years ago, 11 years ago. He isn't any, doing anything different than he did on the Warren Commission. This is the same Warren Commission that destroyed Kennedy's car, autopsy papers, CIA papers of Oswald's that were thermofaxed, uh, contents of the files of CIA lawyer in New Orleans, Dean Andrews, and other vile evidence that would prove Oswald was an FBI CIA agent, both in the United States and in the Soviet Union, Navy intelligence in the Soviet Union, FBI and CIA in the United States. So this cover-up Coleman, our new Secretary of Transportation, another CIA member of the Warren Commission appointed by Gerald Ford, and one who, who argued that Richard Nixon, Nixon should destroy those tapes. Now that's interesting that Mr. Coleman should be doing that because most of the remaining of the program I'm going to talk about a new article in Computer and People on the link of Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford to the Kennedy assassination. The evidence in the tapes that would go back to the Kennedy assassination, you remember the first June tapes in 72, uh, Nixon was saying they'd have to pay E. Howard Hunt because it goes back to the Bay of Pigs. So here's old Coleman again trying to cover up saying, let him burn all of his tapes. Well, of course he wants him to burn them because, again, it would show his complicity in not investigating the assassination properly of John Kennedy. To make Coleman a little thicker into the espionage story, his name appeared at the time of the book funding of Mr. Rockefeller, Nelson Rockefeller, when his CIA conduit of funds was concealing the fact that the Rockefeller brothers uh, wrote a book about the opponent of Nelson Rockefeller, Mr. Goldberg, Arthur Goldberg, at election time in New York. Nelson Rockefeller wanted to be president of the United States. His stepping step board to that job was to be governor of New York, and in a clandestine manner he, to discredit his opponent in order to become governor. He had a book financed by himself, his brother, as a smear job against his opponent, Arthur Goldberg. The funds of the book went to several states, and they were indirect, and there were many washings, like the Watergate washings. And one source of funding that went from A.J. Richardson Dilworth, who was the advisor to the Rockefeller family, and channeled it through a distinguished Philadelphia law firm, which invested in the financial corporation that produced the book. The law firm's name was Dilworth, Paxson, College, Levy, and Coleman, William Coleman again. The literary properties were from Delaware, but they used the law firm in Philadelphia to arrange the publication of the book. And therefore, you could say that Mr. Coleman's appointment as Secretary of Transportation at this time could be possibly a reward for the law firm doing a conduit of funding for the Rockefellers, linked with the Rockefellers as a CIA conduit, or it could be his collaboration with Gerald Ford on the Warren Commission as a CIA lawyer, along with Gerald Ford, and his uh, consideration of uh, coaxing Richard Nixon out and his approving of burning the tapes, he is what you call a really good team member. So don't be deceived by color. Last week we talked about David Bellin, CIA agent, who was white to show you have no prejudice. <laughs> and this week is William Coleman, who is black, but a lot of people may think that 
uh, Gerald Ford, again, is being very liberal in this appointment, uh, like he's appointed a Jew to be the new attorney general. There's no liberalism involved any more than having Louis Neiser help the Warren Commission uh, being a Jew or Judge Kaufman sending the Rosenbergs to the death penalty at Sing Sing. Uh, Jews and blacks are used by the establishment to kill their own, not based on the merits of the case, but to please the team that they want to belong to because maybe they feel that they'll finally be accepted if they're in with the people who are the in crowd. So Republican Coleman's very much in with the in crowd, and uh, I wish him luck in his new job, but I don't think he'll have it once he gets into the sticky business of what it is. As I say, the CIA, there was an article January the 10th, UPI star story by John Doherty, and it tells about the CIA infiltrating the transportation system, air and ground transportation in Europe, and that they had been soliciting secretly various business people on a need-to-know basis to spy on our various allies. And the message was that if your company decides not to participate, send back all correspondence. There's a need for secrecy, and no foreign nationals are to participate. Only American CIA were to investigate transportation uh, overseas of our allies over there, NATO allies as well as the USSR. So the CIA in the Department of Transportation at home and the CIA in air and ground transportation overseas fits in with the original stories that broke on the CIA just a few weeks ago that the purpose of all this spying, according to one agent of the CIA who retired, was to control the world. And when you realize that the CIA was formed by Reinhard Galen, the chief of Hitler's intelligence for the Eastern Division, and his goal was to control the world. And then Galen was given $200 million by Alan Dulles to use his agents and to form RCA, CIA after Nazi intelligence. You realize how treacherous the CIA is. I stress it now because there's so much in the news, and there will be for the next five or ten years as it begins to spill out. But these appointments, as they come along, like Bellin and Coleman, I'll point to you their links to the past team and they really are a team. I also wanted to talk about another member of the Warren Commission whose name came out in the news this last week. Um, the three men resigned voluntarily from the secret counterintelligence work inside the CIA, the illegal counterintelligence work. When they discovered that they were working in this department, they quickly resigned. One was Raymond Roca, one was William Hood, and the other was Newton Miller and their work was inside the USA and counterintelligence. So Roca's name also comes up because he was linked to Lee Harvey Oswald when Oswald returned from the, United, from the USSR to the United States. He was a CIA agent in charge of his papers and worked with the Warren Commission. As I say, Oswald was high up in intelligence. He wasn't uh, just doing footwork as a poor boy who came over to Russia and didn't like America and decided to come back. He was high up in intelligence, in contact with John Conley and all the higher-ups, and Raymond Roca was the CIA agent in counterintelligence who worked with Lee Harvey Oswald and worked with the Warren Commission, and he is the gentleman who resigned quickly from the counterintelligence, hopefully so he can't be further investigated last week. There's another name that crops up in the Warren uh, Commission that I might mention who's active with Mr. Kissinger. His name is Boris Klossen, K-L-O-S-S-E-N. And I bring this up to show you how thickly the CIA was involved with Oswald and with the Kennedy assassination and with Gerald Ford, a member of the Warren Commission who is now president. Boris K. H. Klossen was appointed by Kissinger, and Kissinger's recommendation as the top-ranking political intelligence officer for the U.S. negotiating team assigned to the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks. This is Boris Clausen, appointed by Kissinger as the top-ranking political intelligence officer for the SALT Talks. It was Boris Clausen who, on July 11, 1961, made it possible for Lee Harvey Oswald to return to the United States with his bride, CIA agent Marina Oswald. Marguerite Oswald wanted her son home. He'd been away in the service three years and in Russia two years. She went to Washington, D.C. She called the State Department 
and in two hours was in the State Department. This is Marguerite Oswald, the mother of Lee Harvey Oswald, who said he was a CIA agent the day he was arrested. Three weeks later, in March, Lee Oswald wrote to the State Department and said, I'm ready to come home now. I want my passport and I want money. He had turned it in at the embassy at the time uh, he began to live in the Soviet Union. That was in March. In July 1961, Boris Kossin, Kissinger's top man on the SALT team, made it possible for uh, Lee Harvey Oswald to return. It was on behalf of U.S. Ambassador that Mr. Clausen was the man who signed the statements indicating that Oswald was ready to come home. He said Oswald was disillusioned and ought to be permitted to return to our country, and he provided the money in the papers. It was Clausen who authorized the money to finance the trip home for Lee Harvey Oswald and his wife. It was Clausen who wrote the letter clearing Oswald, and he's appointed by Kissinger to be the head intelligence agent on the SALT team. So Raymond Roca's name came in the news today, of this week, since we met last week on counterintelligence inside the USA, who worked with Oswald and the Warren Commission. Boris Clausen's name comes up in conjunction with Kissinger. Oswald and Marina Oswald and their money home, State Department. Oswald uh, borrowed the money in quotes. There's no indication he earned it or paid it back or gave it. It was an outright gift, but the Warren report said he borrowed it. And Warren Commission Coleman is in the news as the head of our Department of Transportation. Uh, just to bring the Warren Commission up to date, we have uh, Gerald Ford, the President of the United States, Leon Jaworski, who represented the state of Texas on the Warren Commission, was the chief investigator to let many people slip by and not really hit the hard points of the Watergate investigation. And he ran home, and this can be verified now because he got into absolute evidence of murders that are now available, they were available to the committee, and he ran home before he had to go into these murders pertaining to the Watergate. And Arlene Specter of the Warren Commission was appointed by Nixon to the legal staff of his defense team. Wesley Lieber of the Corp Warren Commission was appointed by Nixon to the Commerce Department. Dr. Jolly West, who was the psychiatrist from the CIA to interview Jack Ruby, is the same doctor who asked two years ago for the funding of the federal government out in California for the Center for the Study of Violent Behavior that you've heard me talk about. Now, I fought very hard for a year to try to stop uh, that study from going through, and this is the study that the Senate committee uh, talked about. They were going to use psychosurgery, experimental drugs on involuntary incarcerated individuals, and the Senate Committee on Constitutional Rights referred to it as a state of fascism or something in that effect. Um, they put off the funding for two years. Hopefully, Safer California can be put off, like the Center for the Study of Violent Behavior, if we all get together and get behind it. Joseph Ball of the Warren Commission was the oil, a lawyer for John Ehrlichman as a defendant in the raw burglary at Dr. Lewis Fielding's office in Beverly Hills, Daniel Ellsberg, psychiatrist, and we have David Bell and the CIA lawyer for the Rockefeller's Committee to investigate the CIA. These are active people from the Warren Commission in positions of power today. I also want to refer to a... Uh, some research I did on the Warren Report. In the Warren Report, not the commission hearings, but the actual Warren Report, it mentions, um, page 327, that Director John A. McCone and Deputy Director William Helms of the Central Intelligence Agency testified before the Warren Commission that no one connected with the CIA had ever interviewed Oswald or communicated him in any way. This was the Warren Report, page 327. And yet, through extensive research and through a book, uh, Who's Who in the CIA, and I'll give you the address where you can order it, Mr. John McVicker of the CIA, born 1922, was the agent in charge of Marina Oswald coming to this country. He was in the Soviet Union. He was a CIA agent in charge of Marina Oswald's papers and her entry from the Soviet Union to Washington. She, they didn't go to Washington. They went to New York and then to Fort Worth and Dallas. Mr. John McVicker of the CIA was the agent in charge of Marina Oswald. Mr. Richard Snyder, born 1910, had a station in Moscow. He was the CIA agent in charge of Lee Harvey Oswald. 
I bring this up now because as they talk about the illegal activity of the Central Intelligence Agency, these are active CIA people working with CIA agents. Richard Snyder was in charge of Lee Harvey Oswald. John McVicker was in charge of Marina Oswald. Another CIA man, John Crichton, working illegally inside the United States as a CIA agent. He lives in Texas, was the man who uh, assigned the interpreter for Marina Oswald. Crichton is from military intelligence, assigned the interpreter, another intelligence agent for Marina Oswald when Lee Harvey Oswald was arrested. Another CIA agent working in the United States is Dr. Rudolf August Winnecker, born 1925 in Germany, and he was born in Germany. He's a lecturer in history. He's a historian in the War Department. He's the chief of the historical division of the Pentagon. Mr. Winnecker is a gentleman who, in the minutes of the Warren Commission, uh, when they wanted somebody to write the Warren Report, Chief Justice Earl Warren said, that Mr. Winokur would send two men, one from the Air Force and one from the Army, to write the Warren Report for Dr. Rudolph August Winokur from the Central Intelligence Agency sent two military agents to write the Warren Report. So when we get into the thick of whether the CIA is involved domestically or not, I can provide you ammunition for the next 20 years for dialogue conspiracy. I do want to tell you about an article that will run in for the next five minutes and maybe continue next week. Computers and People, January 1975. If you can subscribe to it, that's good because every month they have valuable articles. If you're at a place where you can't subscribe or you get to a library, copy this or as many articles as you can going back to May 1970. This is an excellent article by Richard Sprague, January 1975, Computer and People. And it's about Gerald Ford and Richard Nixon and the political assassinations in the United States. That's the title, Gerald Ford, Richard Nixon, and the political assassinations. I want to give you the address in case you want to write to computer and people. It's 815 Washington Street, Newtonville, Massachusetts, 02160. Who's who? This is Computers and People, 815 Washington Street, Newtonville, Massachusetts. I was going to say order who's who in computer, but you don't need that. Ask for the, the issues going back to May 70 if you can afford them. But this is an article on Gerald Ford, Richard Nixon, and uh, the political assassinations. And I'll read a few points of the hypothesis of this article. Of course, he begins with the point that uh, E. Howard Hunt wanted a million dollars and um, right from the beginning for a cover-up, and he brings up the point of the pardon of Richard Nixon. Why was it so important that Gerald Ford give the pardon to Richard Nixon on September the 8th, 1974? And he says the latest act in this drama goes back to 1960, and he points out, number one, that Nixon was White House case action officer for the Bay of Pigs invasion in 1960. Two, that Nixon was in contact with E. Howard Hunt and others during the Bay of Pigs planning. Three, Nixon lied to the American people by his own admission about the Bay of Pigs during his TV debates with Kennedy in 1960. Four, Nixon was linked financially to the mafia and the Cuban casino operators before Castro took over. Five, Nixon was acquainted with E. Howard Hunt, Bernard Barker, Martinez, Frank Sturgis, and Carlos Prio Siqueiros and other Watergate people and anti-Castro people in Florida. He was financially linked to them in addition to working with them as vice president under Eisenhower. Six, Hunt, Barker, Sturgis, and Socaras were definitely connected with the assassination cabal in the murder of John Kennedy. Seven, Nixon was in Dallas for three days, including the morning of the assassination. Eight, Nixon went to Dallas under false pretenses. He said there was a board meeting of the Pepsi-Cola Company, and there was no more board meeting that day. Nine, Nixon did not admit being in Dallas the day Kennedy was shot and never revealed the true reason for his trip. Ten, the research indicates that Nixon either knew in advance or learned immediately afterwards about the cabal and the assassination of Kennedy. 11. Nixon proposed to Lyndon Johnson that Gerald Ford serve on the Warren Commission. 12. Ford led the Warren Commission in the cover-up. He controlled the key witnesses. 5. 
Ford held plant the idea that Oswald was the only assassin. There was no conspiracy in his own book called The Portrait of the Assassin. Well, there are 33 points here that are very valuable, and I will read to them. I think I'll continue next week and read them to you and maybe go in detail about them because they're terribly important. So as the CIA unfolds and the FBI stories unfold, remember there's more to come because yet nobody is talking about the political assassinations, and that's what Dialogue Conspiracy is about, the evidence that relates to the political assassinations, the ones that happened from 60 up to the current assassinations. My time is up, and I'll see you next week on Dialogue Conspiracy. This has been Dialogue Conspiracy with political research specialist May Brussel, who for 10 years has been researching the facts behind political assassinations and conspiracies in this country. Dialogue Conspiracy originates with KELRB-FM in Carmel, California.